My name is Dr. Drew Albert. We have Dr. Jimmy Gannon and future Dr. Noah Alagami. Did I say your name right? An emirate is a territory ruled by an emir, a title used by monarchs okay, for high office. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> Bad Was Siri. it uh, reading the origin of Noah's name? Or... Oh my gosh, what is going on? <laughs> okay, there we go. I need somehow I, future reference. Doyle, remind me to disable Siri on all devices. <laughs> so um, we're here in the ortho conditioning grand rounds Wednesday evening. This has been a thing we've been doing the last month now. And I kept thinking to myself, why don't we just make this something that is recorded, have fun with it, and then people can listen back in and catch up if they can't make it on a Wednesday. So I think at least experimenting wise, we should try this, see how it works, see what people think and kind of move forward with any feedback we get from, from, uh, people involved. I think it'll be fun. It does take some getting used to talking on mics and not doing weird, like ums and what, and like over and over again. So bear with us as we get used to that. So we are here talking about match strategy, away rotations and um, kind of just things we wish we would have known ahead of time in this whole ortho match process. Uh, this is, you know, kind of the basis of why I wanted to start this platform in the beginning was just to have information that was easily accessible for people going through the process and for individuals that might not have a good network or a ton of friends or family that are already in the game. Uh, so hopefully this is helpful to that group. Um, kind of just uh, hope, hoping that someone who doesn't have it, just a ton of connections can really benefit. So kicking us off, just wanted to have our other speakers introduce themselves really quick. Give us a little bit of your backstory, fun fact, and then um, we'll go from there. I can jump in next. My name is Jimmy Gannon. I'm a first year uh ortho resident um currently in my fifth going on six month um yeah i'm happy to happy to be here happy to kind of share my experiences having just gone through uh the cycle last year and away rotations last year um uh yeah i like when drew had kind of suggested this to me i just thought it was a great idea because in medical school, I, I heard a couple podcasts. I don't know if you guys are familiar with like the undifferentiated medical student where they bring people on and kind of interview them. And I remember learning a lot from that. So I thought this would be kind of fun to do and we can kind of have a little Q and a afterwards too. So nice to meet you guys. Fun. Do you have a fun fact that you'd like to share? Um, I feel like we always I, do that when, when, when people come <laughs> and work with us, we're like, okay, we need a fun fact. Yeah, let's see. I um, I really don't. I mean, I don't. I think inj injuries are always fun. No I fun. don't. I don't really have a good orthopedic injury. Fortunately, I had my front tooth shot out with an airsoft BB, Ooh. which I think was an incredible shot from my friend. So, <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Fun fact. Fun fact. I can't even tell. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so I guess it's my turn. Uh, my name is Noah Alagami. Um, I'm a fourth year medical student at CHM. Uh, happy to be on here. So thank you, Drew, for for setting this up. And it's it's just great to uh, to join you and Dr. Gannon. Uh, and, and like Jimmy was saying, uh, there's I feel like uh, for for orthopedics in general, there's a lot of information um, out there, and sometimes it's difficult to find and. And so it's nice, I think, to have kind of a, a talk about the most frequently asked questions like we're going to have tonight. Um, and I think it, I would have benefited from something like this personally uh, last year. But uh, just a little bit about myself. So I'm I pretty much lived in Michigan my whole life. I did my undergrad at U of M Dearborn um, and then uh, uh, took like a gap semester off and then just went straight to med school. Um, and uh, I, I love orthopedics. I'm interested in joints right now, but it changes like all the time. Uh, and yeah, I'm just happy to be here. So fun fact, I usually get like different fun facts all the time. Uh, I'll, I'll say that I play a ton of video games. 
and I, I like a ridiculous amount, especially right now in fourth year. And I play them competitively as well, which is always fun. Uh, but that's my fun fact. Most money you've made from playing video games competitively. Probably my friend's money, honestly, just because uh, that's that's just like when you it's like when you're a good golfer and you go out with your buddies on the weekend and you make easy money. So, nice. uh, OK, you don't I'll you don't have to share paper. that. It's probably probably <laughs> significant, though. So just a quick blurb about myself is um, I'm a twin. That's always my fun fact. My brother works on the east side of the state. I also went to CHM and those for those who don't know what that is, that's Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Everyone asks, like, why do you have why do you have to say it's human medicine? It's because we have osteopathic medicine and veterinary medicine. So I have to specify. Um, I also kind of grew up in Michigan. Uh, I also fun. Another fun fact, worked in a gold mine, um, which kind of was prompted me to think of what other future should I figure out for myself? So ended up in medicine. I think ortho surgery was a good fit, just working with your hands and doing that type of thing. But cool, let's keep moving. First uh, order of questions, I wanted to kind of get into the away rotation scene. There's a lot of nuances with choosing aways and strategies in regards to like how many to apply for, which ones should I apply for, where should I go, what should I do? So uh, Noah has just gone through this process where he's done his aways, he's gone through the whole thing. So Noah, why don't you kind of talk a little bit about what your strategy was, um, what you had heard from people and what you ended up doing and maybe what you wish you would have done. Yeah, sure. So I actually jotted down some notes because I feel like this is a, uh, a pretty big topic and especially in the, like a third year medical students uh, on, on their mind a lot is, is choosing your aways. And I feel like my approach when I was choosing my aways was um, primarily based on location. So I knew, you know, pretty much my entire family is here in Michigan. So I knew I wanted to be somewhere in the Midwest. And that's kind of where uh, that's that's where my priorities lie. Uh, and for everybody, I think it's important to take into account a couple of things with away rotations. There's location, like I just mentioned, there's the type of program that you're looking at, whether it's a community program, an academic program. Um, and then there's there's other things that I didn't really appreciate until now, and that's how competitive are you as an applicant? Uh, does that program interview their rotators and do they match their rotators? And I think that's something that I didn't appreciate back then that would be worth taking a look at when you're, when you're planning your rotations. Um, I think I could, I'll briefly talk about competitiveness and then uh, I'll hand the mic over to see if Jimmy or Drew want to chime in. But I think it's important when you're, when you're applying for your away rotations to kind of, to be strategic in the sense that you, you talk to other individuals, whether or not they're residents or your mentors, uh, attendings in the field, um, and, and show them your CV and see if they, uh, how competitive they think you are. And, and whether or not some of the programs that you're picking would be a good fit for you, because at the end of the day, the most uh, you're going to be receiving interviews from the places you rotate at most of the time. Um, and, and if you go to these programs and you're not that competitive, even if you do have an interview or if you don't get an interview, then your chances of matching there obviously can be lower. So that's one thing to take into account that I didn't really appreciate. So you're saying even if you rotate at a place doesn't guarantee you being competitive on their rank list. Exactly. And so it's, it's far easier to get an away rotation at these programs than to get an interview. And so I think that's one thing that some people can kind of fall victim to is if you get chosen for an away rotation, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are like a top candidate in their eyes. They might just have a very, a, a broad, uh, they might take a broad uh, a variety of students in terms of com uh, competitiveness. And uh, when I was at Emory, they, some of the residents told me that they only have a certain number of interview spots and they would take every month, they take 12 students. And so that's a lot of rotators. And they would tell me straight up that some of these students, they know they're not going to interview them because they know they wouldn't be a good fit and they wouldn't want to waste an interview on someone 
that they think wouldn't be a good fit for their program. So some of these programs, if they don't have a great history in interviewing their rotators, and if you look at their match list and they don't take a lot of home students or they take students from other programs and they have a history of not matching their rotators, that's another thing to consider because that's valuable time. You know, that's a whole month you could be rotating at another uh, program that would be a better fit for you and, and you have a better chance at matching. So you're saying there's a huge factor in regards to fit. So the thing that I always debate back and forth is if I was a med student, would I want a program to tell me, hey, we're not going to interview you despite me having rotated there? Or do I wish just every program I rotated at gave me a courtesy interview and left me in the dark? So which is the right one? Because I think our, our program in particular has gone back and forth on that. So I'm interested to hear what you think. Uh, you know, for me, it's, it's always, and I think this is just because everybody in this field is like very like ultra competitive and you're always striving to do the best. And so I guess in your, in your mind, you're always thinking, oh, I'm, I'm a great rotator. And so I'm going to get an interview no matter what. Right. And so. I'm not sure if courtesy interviews is, I don't even know how you'd be able to tell if you're getting a courtesy interview, unless you just felt like the, the vibes were bad or, or if a resident told you that, Hey, we interview like everybody, but it doesn't mean anything. Um, so I, I mean, I'm interested to see what Jimmy has to say about that. Yeah. And you know, Noah, kind of like, kind of like you, I, I don't know as much just cause I just started residency. So I'm sort of still learning kind of the details of that too and just coming up on the first application cycle where i'm not a part of it so i guess not a very satisfying answer but maybe i'll be able to answer it you know down the road um i do want to touch on a few things that noah brought up Noah, you you mentioned some really good points in terms of like uh, strategies for choosing in a way um so like you location was big for me so i'm from minnesota um, i went to medical school and college in the midwest and so like my network, my family, a lot of people I know are here in the Midwest. So I felt like, you know, likely I would have a good chance at matching here somewhere around the Midwest. So that was a, a big factor for me. Um, second thing I really looked at was kind of a community versus academic type program. And I feel like, Drew, maybe you can talk this a little bit more. Um, but like there are some programs that are maybe more like uh, they emphasize a candidate's research portfolio and the amount of research that you're producing in residency versus other programs simply don't. And I think uh, each person kind of needs to take a look at what they've done in medical school in terms of research and sort of what their goals are long term in terms of like academics versus maybe being more of a community uh, practicing surgeon and kind of going from there. I heard some interesting advice. Like if you're not sure, I think it can be helpful to plan your ways in a, in a way that you get a variety of experiences. I kind of did that accidentally. I, uh, I rotated at some places that were more kind of a like high volume community uh, locations. And then I also rotated at a place that was more of a academic uh, focused and I didn't plan that, but looking back, I'm grateful that I did because those programs did have a different feel to it. And I could see some people liking one more than the other. Um, yeah. I mean, so yeah, I was just going to say, I think that's a good point. Um, knowing who you are and what your goals are can be really helpful, but if you don't know those things about yourself and where you want to end up, then that's where I think taking that kind of uh, tiered approach is really helpful. So when people ask me, you know, what should I do with a ways? What, where should I target? Um, and, it, and I would say, try to know what your goals are. Are your goals to stay in your family versus you just want to, you want to match at the top tier place or you have a different goal? That's super helpful. But I kind of looking back tell people have your reach program where you're like oh man this is my dream program and i want to rotate there and i would say some of those kind of top tier academic places 
have a good system where they expect medical students to rotate there and then they gear them up to have a successful letter of recommendation at the end. So for example, I've heard that Mayo does a good job at this. You're par partnered with one attending surgeon for four weeks, last I knew. Um, and for reference, I'm a fifth year resident, so uh, I'm a little bit removed from all of this, whereas Dr. Gannon or Jimmy is a first year resident. Um, but when you go to a program like that, they're expecting students to ask for a letter of recommendation and you're trying to earn that letter. And I think that can go a long ways coming from attendings that are literally writing the book and writing all the latest research on a specific subspecialty because everyone that's interviewing you in that subspecialty will be like, oh, you got a letter from Dr. Blank, like a, a big name, like a Parvizi or um, a Vaccaro, uh, like Rothman. And uh, I think that can go a long ways because word of that word of mouth where they're like, oh, I know that guy, or I really trust that guy's research or gal's research. Um, I think when, when people, the community overall is really small. So if your letters are coming from someone that, and a, you're attending that's interviewing you trusts, then that is like, that is really important. And then I tell people like, if you know you wanna be near family, then you should target places near family, knowing that you can literally, like Noah was saying, you can uh, kind of secure an interview at that place versus shoot yourself in the foot if you don't do a good job. So you kind of have to be ready to really rock your away rotations at the places you really wanna be. Uh, and then I think the, the third tier of that kind of strategy is rotating at a place that you really, really think that you have a high chance of matching at. So you have your top tier all the way to maybe a, a more solid chance. And I think people get into trouble when they're like, oh, I'm just going to rotate at a Mayo and an HSS or Mayo, HSS and Emory. And so they have, or Vanderbilt, and they have really competitive away rotations at every single spot. And those are the highest chances that you're going to match somewhere. But you, you can't be upset if you don't match based on those aways because they're so competitive and the spots are so few that you, you have to kind of almost have a backup plan. Would you guys agree with that? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I'm curious, did, um, did the number of spots in a residency program influence your decision to take an away there? Like I can tell you just when I was looking at places to do aways, I, I wasn't as drawn to the ones that maybe had like two people per year. Cause I just felt kind of simple, you know, just simple math. It's numbers. Going yeah. For, if, it's if the there's stats. two seats at this program and then I don't know, six at this other program, they're both a month long and it's a month, it's four weeks of my time here at this program. So I was just kind of curious if that was on your guys' radar at all. I think you have to weigh it hundred percent. I think you have to weigh everything like, uh, I think, I think it's just a really good point because if you spend four weeks with a two spot potential, um, you, you have to be sure that that is really where you want to be. So I wouldn't write that type of program off for in a way, but you might have a better chance at, you know, a five or six, seven, eight person residency. And I think you, you hit the nail on the head there, Drew, when you said, when, when you mentioned like, if you're rotating at Mayo, HSS, Vanderbilt, and I met some people like when I was at Emory that that was their rotation lineup. You're really putting all of your eggs in, in one basket saying like, okay, I want to go to some of these top programs. And uh, I've spoken to other residents who who know people that their their rank list, their top like six or seven ranks would be these these programs. And if you're not ranking them like number one or number two, then you're probably not going to get in. So you can really, and, and that might be, I don't know if we're going to talk about rank list today because that's a whole nother discussion, but um, that's that's another thing to to keep in mind so it's well, very easy go ahead oh i was just gonna say but that's the nice thing about the rank is that it favors the applicant so even if you don't rank a place number one if you're in a top 
in a essentially the phrase is ranked to match at a program let's say it's your third spot but you weren't ranked to match at the your top one and two but you are in your three you'll match in your three whether you ranked them number one or number three so at least that's my understanding of the algorithm so if you're ranked to match somewhere depending on what how many places you're ranked to match and where the algorithm fits then you will match based off of your preference so you, you don't necessarily have to rank those places number one uh unless you know there's some kind of backhanded secret game that you're playing where you're like oh i'm ranking you guys number one and then yeah so that that can get messy but yeah, yeah that's a whole nother conversation yeah but good point um but yeah you can really i feel like you can set yourself up for success when you're choosing your away rotations um, but you can also miss out on some good opportunities and i think another thing to, that we should probably discuss is um, the timing of when you're doing your rotations. If you want to do your home rotation first, if you should do an academic program earlier in the season, because some of these some of these programs you're rotating at, you're going to be getting letters or trying to get letters from. And if you're rotating there, and this happened with me at Emory, and thankfully I, I had already kind of figured my letters out, but if you're rotating there and you're not working with an attending until after Eris is due, or you work with them for a few days, and you can't, you know, logistically ask for a letter in that short period of time. So that that's another thing that to 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 keep in mind when you're you're scheduling your rotations. That's a really good point. The other that's a great point. The other thing that comes up in my mind is, and that, that I didn't know how to handle, and I still may not know how to handle, is what should I do if, you know, you apply for an away, you get accepted, but then you have to decline because you already accepted your full quota of a ways does that burn your chances of an interview and should you be careful about how many ways you apply for that's an awesome point and i remember this being a, a big point of discussion with me and my colleague or like my other classmates when we were applying we kind of assumed that it did or like we kind of went in with the mindset of if i accept because there's, I guess there's two options. One, they can offer and you can just decline it. And then there's another option where if they offer it and you accept it, but then later decline it, that maybe looks worse. And we we kind of had the attitude of it, it like likely would burn that bridge. And so I think that kind of kept us from applying to a ton of a ways. And Drew, I'm so glad you brought this up because I would have forgot to talk about this but yeah i think and noah you had mentioned this earlier too like i think getting in a way rotation is you know it's there's a higher acceptance rate than like getting into a residency like they they tend to let of a lot of applicants or offer a lot of applicants spots and so i think there can be some uh, anxiety in the beginning of oh i got, or like a beginning of the away application process of oh i have to you know apply to you know, 20, 30 programs to make sure I fill my four months. I think you'll fill your four months with fewer than 20 applications. Um, and it will save you a lot of stress <laughs> in yeah. deciding like which ones to accept versus deny. Yep. I don't know if you guys had similar experiences, but. I think it's safe to assume that if you apply for an away and then even withdraw or cancel, uh, you have to kind of be very cognizant that that could communicate that, hey, I don't want to go there as bad as I want to go somewhere else. And therefore, we are not going to invite you for an interview. I don't think it's always that way, but I think that's a safe assumption. So I will chime in here. Uh, it's a great point. I, I was thinking about it uh, as well, uh, like bringing the, the topic up about how many to apply to. I think I applied to maybe... 10 or 12 away rotations um, but I kind of knew going in the programs that I really wanted to rotate at and a lot of them were you know not these high tier programs but they were like local Michigan programs so um, it wasn't I, I kind of felt confident knowing that I would get spots there uh, but there were a there were two programs that I got offers from 
one I accepted and had to turn down because of just like scheduling issues. And the other one, I uh, just rejected it straight up. And the one where I uh, confirmed it uh, and then canceled it, I had called the like, um, uh, like residency, I'm not sure what they're coordinator. Like, uh, coordinator right i called the coordinator and like explained the situation and she was like super nice about it and they ended up sending me an interview and the other place that i just rejected didn't interview me so i have no idea what like i'm not sure what they're looking at or or if they keep track of it i would imagine that they do because of that was my uh understanding going in but it's definitely something to keep in mind because you don't want to be caught in that situation anything else ab- oh sorry Drew. Oh, i was just gonna say anything else about a ways that you guys wanted to cover before we move on to the next thing i guess there was just one other point and Noah, i think you had already typed it in the chat just the idea of word of mouth i remember kind of third year i was just thinking like how do i how do i even research these programs do i go on their websites do i go on their social media i found most valuable for me was just talking to people like word of mouth um it can be helpful to talk to other people in your class. It can be helpful to talk to um, people in the year ahead of you. I would even look at if your school publishes like rank lists or not rank lists, but uh, match lists of prior years at your school and you can see where people went. Um, that's actually how I got into contact. That was my first contact with the program I'm in now. It was a an alumni of my medical school, I got his email and I emailed him and then we set up a phone call. And so that, and then that led me to applying to in a way here. So I do think like talking to your classmates and the people around you is that for me was the most helpful. I I think one piece of advice, if you guys are in, in this situation is exactly what Jimmy just said is just ask for a full list of your alumni that have matched into ortho and blind carbon copy an email to all of them explaining who you are like your scenario i just wanted to reach out because i'm really interested in pursuing an orthopedic surgery career Uh, any advice you would have things you wish you would have known here's our here's some of my questions that i'd love to get answered and pick your brain about uh will you please help me (laughs) something like that uh I did that for our alumni. I think like literally 20 to 30 people responded. They'll tell you how competitive they think you are. They will tell you whether they think you should do a research year or not based on your competitiveness. They'll tell you what their programs are like, what the programs they rotated at are like. And that's probably your biggest wealth of knowledge is reaching out and connecting with your alumni. And um, there's that Excel sheet that you can access via Reddit. Um, So every year someone makes a Google sheet where everyone going through applications fills out. That could be, I mean, sometimes that is helpful in regards to when are interviews going out? uh, What are these programs kind of like? You just have to take it with a grain of salt. People make up some crazy crap. Um, And you can't always trust it. I wanted to jump in really quickly while you were on this topic and mention the Texas Star database, which is a really good uh, database that MSU actually has access to. And it's it's kind of biased because it is dependent on the people who report their like stats and where they match and where they interviewed. Uh, but it still can give you kind of uh, like a bird's eye view of uh, okay, what are the stats that most of these people are, uh, uh, like, what are their step two scores? How many publications do they have? And you can sort by each individual program. So that was pretty helpful for me as well, looking at where to uh, apply for away rotations and also uh, apply for residency. Nice. I say we move on to the next topic, which is just strategies for matching and then kind of the interview process and interview kind of uh, strategies. So in regards to just matching in general, what's something you guys wish you would have known? And if there was one piece of advice you could give, one takeaway, what would it be? So we had kind of talked about this a little bit before the session started. I think 
I think the away rotation is the most powerful tool in your tool belt because it's it's essentially a month long interview. Like you really get to know the program and they get to know you. Um, so I I tried to like max out the amount of time that I did away rotations, and I I don't regret that. I mean, it was a tough tough four months. It's really busy, um, but it's also fun. You get to do ortho all the time and. You know, if if I had a fifth month to do an away rotation, I probably would have done it, honestly. So, um, just in terms of matching, I think that's that's certainly, I think one of the most important variables. Of course, you need to have all the other things. You need to be kind of involved. You, I, I think, doing well in step two is great. But yeah, I would say the away rotation. What do you think, Noah? <laughs> I think right now, um, I, I'll only really comment on like, obviously where where I've gotten to so far. I haven't matched yet, so I can't really talk about that. I will say though, one thing that, uh, and we'll probably end up getting into this, uh, is I wish I was a little bit more selective about my signals. Um, and I don't know if you want to talk about that now, Drew, or if you want to talk about sure. it later. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, so I guess just, I, I wish I was a little bit more selective. I feel like because now uh, ortho has 30 signals when you're when you're going through your ARIS application. Um, and so what that allows you to do is uh, basically signal 30 programs, tell them like, hey, I'm really interested in you. Uh, and, and you're, you know, one of the top 30 programs I have on my list. And I feel like I put a lot of reach schools or I thought I wasn't putting a lot. But after I looked back at it, like weeks after I was like, hey, I probably should have done the majority of my signals in in places where I feel like I'm pretty sure they're going to give me an interview. I'm pretty sure I'm a competitive applicant and I would feel very comfortable um, like applying there. And so uh, if I was to do it again, I think I would limit my the schools that I considered reach school or the, the programs that I considered reach programs um, to like five or less. And five is even a lot, in my opinion. So like maybe having two or three reaches and the rest of them, uh, I think should be places where you're competitive or where you feel that you're competitive. Um, and it's hard, it's hard to make those decisions. And another thing that comes into play with signaling is geographic preferencing, which I don't know if you had this Jimmy when you were, okay. So, uh, yeah, yeah. you can, so you can, uh, preference a, a geographic region and there's like 12 regions or something and the states are kind of split up weird um but programs will be able to see whether or not you geographically if their program is in that geographic region that you put preference towards and so some of these programs are only interviewing people who signaled them uh and they put them in their like region of geographic preference so how um, many geographic preferences do you can you put down i think you get two regions i only put i thought one. i had two last year yeah yeah that's crazy i didn't know what i didn't know about I that believe, no sorry if you said this already i was reading the chat but i think the people in who you geographic preference they can see like the reasons you wrote yeah. that did you say this already yeah well i didn't sorry. say it but it's a good point to bring up because yeah. it, it slipped my mind so you the, when you choose which region you want a little like uh, text box opens and it's like explain basically give a reason why you want to go here. So for me, it's like, oh, my family's here. I've lived here my whole life. I want to stay close, whatever. Um, and so pretty much all my interviews are in that region that I selected. So I didn't think it was going to be that big. I don't know how big of a role it played, but definitely from talking to other people in my year, it seems like a lot of these programs are really only interviewing people who signal them and people who uh, give preference to their geographic region. Um, so I didn't, I feel like I didn't really align some of the signals I put, I could have signal, signaled more programs in that region. And I think if I had to do it again, I would limit my reach programs and make sure that the majority of my programs were in that region. So there was this tweet that one of these, I think it was a resident or attending put out and they looked at all these literally top, top applicants from Ivy League schools that had it all figured out for like 40 plus publications. 
and how many interview invitations they got outside of the programs they signaled. And it was essentially zero. So if you're not signaling a program, you can essentially count that they're not going to invite you for an interview, which is in kind of crazy thinking about it. So Noah, how many places did you apply over 30 si well, like signals? Well, I applied to 66 programs and I didn't get a single interview from outside of my signals. So, okay. and I think, like you said, to back up what you're saying, these are the top, like these are the cream of the crop, right? These are the top candidates in ortho. Um, and there was the uh, literature that was just published on signaling last year showed that 99% of people's interviews are from within their signals. So, so it's it, if you had to redo it, would you have only applied to 30 places? Probably, but it's a hard, like when you're in that situation, it's like I only apply to 30 or spend another thousand dollars and just give yourself the peace of mind. Like what if I get another interview or what if I get two interviews? So it's like, it's tough, but the, the literature. I think the data that, says you know, like, over yeah. 30 you're wasting your money truthfully but yeah. i see what you're saying but no, i can totally empathize yeah i feel like even <laughs> despite knowing it would it came out to be zero <laughs> like even knowing that it's still difficult to go oh yeah i'm just gonna stay right at 30. i do at least yeah. you're saving some money i think i applied to 108 or 110 programs essentially everywhere but california and downtown new york no offense to those places. They're great, I'm sure. But <laughs> I just couldn't picture myself going to uh, going to those scenes. But to, to I guess, uh, put a bow on it nicely, I would say if you're, like, kind of dead set on only doing 30 applications and signaling them, I think that's fine. I, don't, I wouldn't, like, beat myself up if... Uh, like I only applied to 30, like if I went back this year and only applied to 30 and then I found out everybody applied to like 70 and I got, I, I mean, my interviews would still be the same. So I probably wouldn't feel too upset about it. So I think at the end of the day, if you want to only apply for 30, I think that's fine. Um, if you want to apply for more then it's up to you because the, the trend now from all of like the charting, the outcomes of the match, uh, uh, stats is that the application numbers are steadily going down, right? So it's gone from like 90 uh, to like 80, and I think now it's in the 70s. So it's like slowly coming down. So I think that's kind of where they want to go, and that's why signaling was brought out, and so it is working to an extent. So what do you think is the goal for number of interviews? It used to be like 12, 12 to 14 interviews, and, and you could be fairly comfortable that you're going to match at least somewhere. So I'll let yeah. Jimmy go. And then I'll oh. try and... So I think maybe before the session, we were saying like, you know, there's not a lot of published literature on all this. It's funny. That's like the one thing that I actually have seen an article on. I remember when I was going through the application process, I saw, I remember where it was published, but basically they were saying like 10 to 15 interviews would kind of be the sweet spot, um, which drew kind of aligns with what you said. Um, yeah, I'd be interested to see updated info yeah, on if that. If it changed but... based on signaling. But that being said, I know I know somebody who is now a practicing orthopedic surgeon and they had or in fellowship and they had three interviews. So whereas like I know I'm sure there are people who had, you know, fifteen plus interviews who did not end up matching. So I don't think anything's a guarantee, but ten to fifteen, that's just sort of what I went off of. And I think, uh, like at least anecdotally, it's it, it would be interesting to see at the end of the year the um, what the numbers look like. But from everyone I've talked to, it seems like interview numbers are down by like one or two interviews just on average. Um, because I've only, I think I've only spoke with one person who's gotten above like that 12 mark. And they had done a research year and they had like really maximized their potential on that research year. So I'm interested to see where the numbers are at, but that's my mindset going in was, okay, I just want to get to like 10 interviews because if you look at last year's charting the outcomes of the match, once you start getting to that 10, 11, 12, you start to get to 
your percent ma uh, chance of matching starts to get to the 80s and 90s. So if you're right around, I think once you get to 13 interviews based off of last year's data, your chance of matching is 90%. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that makes sense. Because if you're shooting for 15 interviews out of 30, like that's 50%. That's pretty dang high. I think, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what the new trends are uh, over the next few years because this isn't this is all like kind of brand new over the next, over the last like year or two. So any I guess for advice that I wish I would have known like that one thing. Um, when I when I get or talk to people about this, I always say. Be really hungry for information and do it as early as possible. <laughs> so I think the highest performers in our med medical school class were the ones that literally they left no stone unturned in regards to seeking out knowledge about everything. So every lecture they were like going into like minute detail of things that I couldn't even like, I'm like, I was the type of student that was just like, stick i stick with the uh main points and i kind of gloss over them and try to remember everything and do as well as i can on the test these people were like burning it into their brains active recall where they force themselves to like reconjure and reproduce this information that they've memorized in a delayed repetition so they were doing kind of like anki in real life only on steroids because they were literally reproducing the information like either writing it down um, but in an active way I think the rude awakening for students is when they hit med school and they're like I'm just gonna do med school like I did undergrad which is passive studying reading through my notes like a hundred times or just copying my notes a hundred times but those are passive ways to study not active ways where you're like forcing yourself it's that painful forced recall that is i think the most productive uh and then the the factor of doing it early i think when you you i think when you start med school it makes sense to just shoot for your most competitive thing and then you can switch as you go along and you kind of can narrow it down but if you're if you have any interest in orthopedics you should just be like i'm gonna go into ortho and then you you have to just frame your mind of like i'm just gonna work as hard as an ortho resident does in my med school studies and maybe that'll that'll fit and that'll match and it'll work for me in the long run and then you as you get lo farther along it's easier for you to, to readjust to maybe something less competitive rather than more competitive at the last second true I, i'm glad you brought all this up it's like that's uh something i kind of realized in medical school so there like when i was going through there was kind of talk about oh like what do these grades mean? Are grades going to matter anymore? Is step going to matter anymore? And I remember, especially in the first year, maybe even two years, there was, there was all this discussion about like, oh, how well do I need to do on this? Or could I not do well on this and instead do maybe better on this? And you can kind of drive yourself crazy thinking about like where, like where you put your effort. And I sort of realized like, it's always in your best interest to do as well as you possibly can on everything that I think I saw the students who were just the highest performers would just put all their were, were just super energetic like Drew said and would just put it all into everything towards everything and I think even stuff they weren't interested in right and I think does that mean you're gonna hit you know a grand slam every time no but I think putting in the effort like you're going to like Drew said you know shooting for the most competitive thing you'll never look back and go oh man, I wish I kind of like didn't study as hard for that test. <laughs> yeah. Like I've never had that thought once. Now, of course, I think it's needed to say you should take care of yourself and work out and make sure you're sleeping. Um, but just the whole game of, oh, do I need to do well on this or that? Just, just do as well as you can all the time. And that kind of was uh, just like reflecting back on third year because uh one of the things i felt like helped me tremendously was like what you guys were mentioning is just going into uh every activity just trying to learn something right and uh i just have like a very 
for whatever reason, I just love to learn new things. And so, you know, I'd be on my ob guide rotation and I would still like find some sort of enjoyment knowing like, hey, now I know more about this thing, right? And stuff like that, it might feel like it goes unnoticed, but there, like when, when I was looking back at a lot of my like clerkship evaluations, that was like one point that a lot of people would bring up was that, you know, uh, you know, this student was always going out of his way to try to learn and, and try to perform as best as he could, even if it wasn't something that he wanted to go into. And so I think that is the best mindset to have moving forward. And if you're doing that, then as an effect, naturally, it's going to come through in, in your, your uh, shelf exam scores, your step two scores, you'll make connections with people that you didn't think you would, and that might lead to research opportunities and leadership opportunities. So I think that's the, the, the most important mindset to have moving forward. And, and, and that's how you can really make sure that you're getting to where you want to go. I said, let's see, let me refer to my notes section here, and then we'll go into Q and a with a little bit of time left. Um, maybe we'll have more time in the future to talk about some things, but it, one of these questions are, is step two, the most important thing now? What do you guys think? So I don't think it's unimportant. I don't know if phrasing it like that is helpful. I think, I think the way I kind of viewed it was I wanted a certain score and I imagine that score is kind of like a bar that I had to get over. And I felt like if I was underneath that, then maybe ortho wouldn't, Maybe it wouldn't be like impossible, but it would be substantially harder. And I felt like if I was over that bar, like how over that bar I was, it was debatable on how helpful that was. And so to put some numbers on it, like I hear 250. So I, I'm old. I took step like step one was I had a score for step one and sort of the score that everybody talked about was like, oh, you want a 250, you want a 250. But I never heard anybody say, I didn't really see any data saying, oh, but if you have like a 265, you'll get way more interviews than if you have a 255, for example. So I, I just like remember, you know, me and a lot of my classmates were just kind of shooting for a certain bar. Um, no, I, and Drew, I don't know if you guys had a certain experience with step two and step one respectively, but... So my advice on that is get as high as you possibly can. And I think it can only help you. And then when you get to a certain point where you're in the top, like 10th percentile or higher, um, I don't know what the data is these days, but I think it used to be over 260. Then residency programs at that point are like, oh yeah, we want you to come here if you're not a weirdo. <laughs> and... To, to put it bluntly. So I think these people score in the 270s, 280s. It's like, okay, they're obviously a genius at taking multiple choice exams, but how is their emotional intelligence? How are they doing on their ways? Are they a good interviewer? Do, would I want them to be my doctor? Uh, but I think people that are scoring that high and pr showing that they're in the top like 10th percentile or above that that can only help you and it's all about your goals like are are you shooting for that top top place um that is very competitive at least in the eyes of everybody else i wouldn't say that it, it, you you might get a better experience based on your personality and your goals at some place other than an hss or a, a male so it's not for everyone so, and it's not like U.S. news or whatever. It's like the end-all be-all for what these schools can produce and what's important. Um, but yeah, that's my view. And in terms of data from what I've seen, um, once again, from charting the outcomes of the match, that's a great document, by the way, to take a look at because it, it kind of stratifies a lot of the things that we're talking about. Um, like clerkship grades, step two scores, publications, stuff like that. Um, it's kind of a logarithmic curve from what I understand where you get to like that 250 range. And once you get there, you're kind of like, it's almost like, I think 
Jimmy's uh, analogy was great where it's like, that's kind of just a bar that you have to cross um, to kind of get to just be competitive and be amongst uh, the, the, the pack of applicants that will, will match. Um, but I think above and beyond that, I mean, I think what, what Drew was saying is like, I, I don't know how much stock, if I met somebody and I, I, and they told me they got like a 280, I'd probably think they were like, kind of like some uh, that, that they were either a genius and they would just sit in their, uh, room and study all day and wouldn't be like a fun person to hang out with, or they would just somehow retain all their, their, their information, but yeah, like a special um, gift. I, yeah, exactly. So, uh, I think it's kind of like a bar. That's what I told myself when I was studying is obviously get as high as you can. Um, but with a goal in mind, and once you cross that goal, uh, and, and you get hopefully the score that you want, uh, I don't think there's really too much to dwell on. Yeah. I, I, I should go back and say, I agree with everything Jimmy said, because, um, you, you will drive yourself crazy of like, Oh, I need to get super, super high, but have that kind of goal in mind of what, what you need to get to. I remember doing that, but I think it, the higher your step scores are, the easier it is for you unfortunately at least that's how it used to be i think people surprise themselves too like if you set yourself a high bar i think your actions will carry you towards that um almost kind of naturally versus if you go oh i'm just gonna shoot for you know kind of a medium score um so kind of on this topic though say you know an applicant does not get that score that they're looking for and I think, you know, now they're finding out that score summer between their third and fourth year. So in that situation, kind of what would be, what would be the strategy or what would be the next move? Drew, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, it's, it's a tough scenario because in a perfect world, your ability to do what you your dream job is isn't connected to a number that you've been assigned based on how well you can do at a multiple choice test but i think there are scenarios that you just cannot overcome um, one of them is being having a either super low step score or failing the boards um, i think it'd be very very difficult to come back from that i don't think it's impossible um, to match in orthopedics after failing your boards. But I think you have in that, in that scenario, you'd have to have a backup plan. Um, and I think a lot of people would give that advice having backup plans, but, um, it, it's tough because people get so set on, like, I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon, but a lot of the orthopedic surgeon mentors that if they look at your, you know, a really low step score, they'll say, well, you can be happy doing anything. And I don't know if I, I don't know if I agree with that advice because I think there's, yes, you can get the satisfaction of working with patients and taking care of them in all sorts of different subspecialties in different scenarios, but it's not, it's, you're always going to be like, ah, but orthopedics is cool sawing bones are cool total knees total hips are cool um so uh, at the end of the day if i had a a lower than ideal step score i think i'd have to go to my trusted mentors and then take all their advice compile it in my mind and go at it with a grain of salt like what are these people really telling me in, in my regards to being able to match with the score based on my whole application, kind of everything I am and everything I've done. And then you just kind of, kind of have to weigh it for yourself and come up with a strategy from there. I don't think there's a perfect answer. I don't think there's a, a one right answer. Um, I know for our program, we've had people match with step scores um, just over 220 territory and we've had people match with step scores in the two high 260s if not 270s um so different programs prioritize different things some pro programs just they want the 260s and above other programs are like i want the hardworking, 
fun to be with, hyper intelligent, emotionally intelligent, and someone who I'm not afraid if they're going to pass their actual step, like part one boards after a residency. So I think our, our residency program does a good job of weighing that where we want people to be sure that we're going to be confident that they're going to be able to just be a good test taker so they can pass their actual boards after residency. But at the end of the day, we want a Dr. Jimmy Gannon, who's easy to work with, hardworking, intelligent, um, can learn from mistakes, the, the many mistakes, just kidding. <laughs> this is all hypothetical, right? <laughs> Hypothetically speaking. And I do want to add, I think that's an excellent point um, that you made, Drew, uh, is uh, away rotation performance. And we talked about this briefly, you know, you can really elevate your application by really, you know, crushing an away rotation. And you can, you know, shoot yourself in the foot if you're not, if you don't perform well, or if it just isn't a great fit for you. And I think if you're in a situation like that, where you aren't, where, let's say, even if you have a, a step score that's just around the average, which is still below like the ortho average, uh, having a great away rotation not only can secure secure you an interview, but you, those uh, experiences and those impressions really matter. I feel like in the resident sides. Yep. So let's go to a quick Q and A here. Um, let me look through this chat. Did I miss anything? I was kind of saving all the questions for the end. Where can you find information on whether programs interview or match their rotators? We kind of covered that. Um, how do you maximize? I think a lot of that's going to be word of mouth. Yeah. Personally, that's how I heard about certain programs. How do you maximize away rotations without applying too many? That's another delicate balance. Noah said you can rank the dates you want to rotate. Get creative on how you apply. Choose to rank August as number one month at one place and September at another. I would also mention yeah, and... a lot of oh, over sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. A lot of away rotations are first come, first serve in terms of applications. So you want to apply day one as early as possible to maximize your chances. Anything to elaborate on with that, Noah? Might have stepped away a second. Um, I would just say to um, Doyle, so a lot of these programs get back to you really quickly, fortunately. Like some got back to me within a week. Um, however, there are some that will get back to you in like, one got back to me in five months, which was not ideal. But I don't, I think that's the exception and not the norm. So you can start making decisions pretty quickly and start filling up your months really quickly where you wouldn't have to apply to 20 programs because you might say, hey, I already have, you know, two of my four months filled. I hope that, hope that's helpful. And if you guys have any questions, raise your hand on the screen and we can invite you up to, to ask them. Sebastian is asking any comments on the order in which you rotate for a ways? Like, should you do your favorite programs later on, or is it just a numbers game and you can't really plan it out that much? Yeah, I try. remember I tried to strategize some, like most people try to do their home rotation, like their home away first, where you do your month of ortho at your hospital if you have, if you, if your hospital does have a home ortho program. I think that's the way to go. Um, you hopefully by that time know most if not all of the residents you've met many of the attendings and you know the hospital you know the layout you can quickly be helpful and find the emergency department and stuff so i feel like it's a good starter month for doing the rotation i would agree with that i think it is difficult to get geared up in orthopedics especially a lot of med schools completely ignore musculoskeletal education for a hundred percent of the time until you get to your always. So, uh, like Jimmy was saying, if you can do your home rotation where maybe people will be a little bit forgiving, you just tell them up front, like, Hey, this is my first rotation. I want to learn as much as I possibly can here. I'm just excited to be here. And then they'll be like, okay, yeah, let's get you geared up for your future ways. At least that's how I approach that. When I rotated as a med student, 
I remember kind of telling the the guys I was working with in the residency, like, hey, this is my first away rotation. Sorry, I don't know much. I didn't have a home like program. So my first away, I was like, you guys are kind of going to be my home program. <laughs> um, and they were totally cool with it. They're like, okay, let's just teach you as much as we possibly can in the time you have with us. So quick plug. I think that's that was my goal in kind of starting another reason for starting ortho conditioning and then specifically writing a, a course that addresses a lot of the things that you can really stand out as a med student, like knowing how to read x-rays, MRIs, and being really geared up for kind of common rotations like orthotrauma and some arthroplasty so that you go in there and, and, and you're more prepared than I was as a med student. So that's my, that's my plug for what we call the Atlas course. And uh, I know Jocko at the end of his podcast, all he does is talk about Malk and selling his jujitsu ju jerseys. <laughs> so th this is, that was my ode to uh, Jocko podcast. Doyle, we, we invite you on stage. Do you, do you have a question you wanted to ask? Yeah, quick question. So um, at CHM with anatomy, um, it's not really stressed especially for us, I don't know if the curriculum is different as they, as time progresses. Um, and so I, it's not really taken that seriously. And so I guess my question is how important is learning anatomy and, how, and do you have any tips on learning it in general? Because I don't, I think CHM is taking a very like low stress approach, which is great for focusing on step studying, but not great if, you're really trying to maximize learning anatomy. I can chat a little bit about that. Um, to whenever. Sorry, my, my laptop died, but I'm still here. <laughs> no worries. Uh, so it's all based on what are your goals for the anatomy? Is it learning it for orthopedics or learning it for your step exams? If it's like, obviously it's good to memorize what all the structures are in the human body and you can just like point at something and know it. That's usually how typical anatomy courses in med school run. But I would say applied anatomy is more important in regards to how is this used in a very specific clinical scenario. And I think one of the best ways to get that information is through practice questions. So like UWorld or all the other crazy databases that places have. Um, and so that's in regards to step prep or studying for ortho specific. Everyone says, Oh, you need to get ortho netters and you'll open handbook of fractures or ortho netters and be like completely lost. Um, and it's in my opinion, not a great way to study for the surgeries you're about to see and that you should be studying approach specific or surgery specific anatomy. So there's books that the residents, a lot of our residents are using like Weissel's operative techniques or operative technique books that when you go through it, they will tell you what structures you're going to encounter, how to mobilize them, how to stay away from the bad things, what bad things are in the area, um, what to retract, what, what you're going to encounter literally step-by-step step, all the way down with pictures. So it's like orthonetters on steroids that actually has application to what you're literally about to see in the operating room. So you, you wonder like, man, how do, how do these attendings, how do these residents know exactly what's going to be where, when, even if they're early on in their residency career, maybe not so much for attendings cause they're, they just do it all, all day, every day. Um, but residents are studying kind of the approach specific anatomy that's applied to the surgery they're doing, not just going to uh, like traditional anatomy book and studying every single structure everywhere all at once, if that makes sense. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. I, I would use a mit like it, Doyle. It sounds like you're maybe a first year or second year. I I did first. the matter. Are right, you a first year? Yes. Got it. Yeah. So back then I did a lot of netter, which I really liked. Um, but that is your job is to kind of know every structure. 
right now, whereas Drew brings up a great point, like on an away rotation, they're not asking you every structure. A lot of the times they, you'll get asked a question during the approach of the surgery and they want to know specifically like, what are the muscle planes that I'm looking for? What is the specific structure that I want to avoid? And for that, there's better res yeah, better resources like Drew had said. One that I really enjoyed was it's called Hoppenfeld Surgical Approaches. And it they have like really great illustrations and it's I think it's like very reader friendly. It just kind of um sort of takes your hand <laughs> through the surgery and just like very clearly and succinctly uh, tells you what you need to know. And that, so that's called Hoppenfeld. I can put that in the chat too, if you're curious. Uh, so I, you know, great points. I think um, really studying like the anatomy by approach in like third year and fourth year is is the way to go like what uh drew and, and jimmy were saying and there's great textbooks out there like why i use that in hoppenfeld um but uh, i i feel like for me the anatomy i learned in medical school when i got into the operating room i had no idea what i was looking at so it, what i found myself doing was i would watch uh surgeries and approaches like online even if they were on cadavers to see um, to kind of at least visualize like what I was looking at. And the more and more that you see, um, the easier it does become. I kind of liken it to, um, I mean, it's going to be a video game reference, so I'm sorry. But like if you play the same map on a game over and over, like in Halo, if you play Blood Gulch all the time, you know where everything is by virtue of just playing that map over and over. And it kind of feels like that sometimes once you start to see, especially if you're doing something like arthroplasty where you're seeing the same approach over and over again. Um, but I would say right now as a first year, one thing you could do that CHM offers, they have a pro section uh, like elective you could take in the summer and you can do like an upper extremity or a lower extremity and really dissect um, out uh, and do a, a cadaveric di dissection. And that's also really helpful. Is that Thank you. Does that answer That's your question, Doyle? Perfect. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Nice. Angel, do you have a question? Did I say your name right? Yeah. Yeah, I got a quick question. Um, oh, I think when I asked a lot of like residents and um, attendants about what makes like, a, and then I think that's possibly the most cliche question I could ask that what makes for a successful applicant. Uh, the common answer I usually get is, you know, do well in school, do well in the staff. Um, but I've always wondered, is there any, like, um, special characteristic or, you know, extracurricular activity that you typically see uh, as, like, a common theme sort of thing among, like, successful applicants just based on you guys' experience interacting with your, co your colleagues and seeing other um, residents come through? Is there anything beyond, you know, the typical just do all in uh, staff, do all in school? Uh, you see any other thing like that come through? I think two things come to mind. Um that are most important in, at least in my mind. Um, and that I've feel like has been a theme. It, the first thing is just like grit. So people that have actually like done life and have gone through hardship and have, they just keep going no matter what. I think there's a lot of research out there that says people are going to get through ortho residency and become a good ortho surgeon. If they have a lot of grit or determination, that they're just going to keep going no matter what. Uh, I think that's really important. The other thing is, um, I think people that are just really themselves and have shown that they're really passionate about something and they stick with it. So I got some advice um, before med school about applying and kind of going through the whole process of uh, that whole, just the whole journey. And they, the guy, one of my mentors was like, Hey Drew, you just need to do what's unique and what you enjoy and something that maybe makes you stand out. Because at the time I was like, should I keep working as a gold miner in Alaska? Because it's not medical related. Cause I was literally about to quit my job doing that and, and go be an EMT or something because I'm like, I, I need to get into med school 
they're not going to accept me if I show that I'm just a gold miner. <laughs> and I think that was him giving me that advice that saying like, oh, well, just take a, a wilderness field medic course and become the gold mining medic and just keep doing that because it's super interesting and you're going to get a ton of great experience in life and whatever else. I think that was so helpful because, and I didn't realize it then, but looking back, all my interviews and things that I've been asked about and things I care about in my life experience and leadership and so on and so forth, grit, determination has all come from uh, a lot of that from my gold mining experience. And it just keeps coming up in my interviews um, because it stands out and people are like, oh yeah, you're, you're that gold miner guy or whatever. And so if you can, I think it, a lot of people's applications kind of run together when they're just shooting for like, oh, I need to be like everybody else. I need to go be a uh, EMT or I need to go get, get myself an ACL injury and then talk about it in my personal statement. <laughs> um, so I would be passionate, be yourself, be determined, have grit. Yeah. That's my answer to that. Awesome points. I, I would add to that. I think the people I've seen, I think do well, like in medical school and I haven't been in residency as long as true, but just like on away rotations and stuff, it seems that people who have, who are for sure hardworking, but also have like a good attitude, you know, like you, it is possible to be very hardworking, but not maybe be the most upbeat, most kind of like optimistic. And it's one thing to say, it's one thing to have like a really good attitude and be a team player at, you know, 11 a.m. But it's another thing at 2.30 a.m. Right. And you're kind of in that where the, the you know, your eyes are starting to burn when you're on a 24, right? It's harder to be upbeat then. But I think to Drew's point, you know, having like the grit and just trying to be team player, be positive, and just try to help out the team. I think those people I've witnessed, do, I, I've seen them do well. That's a really good point. And truthfully, I think a lot of people forget, myself included, that it's literally all about patience in the end. So people, it, it's always easy to be like, oh yeah, I want to be part of the ortho team. It's all about the residents. It's all about the team. But at the end of the day, it's actually about the patient. And so so I think people stand out when they actually care about patients and you can tell. Um, and attendings that really care about patients will ask you questions like, what is the most impressive thing you have done for a patient? And some people can't answer that because they're like, uh, I wasn't really thinking about that. I mean, patients are cool, but the ortho team, that's what's cool. And so I think I've suffered from that where a lot of my personal statement maybe and what I focused on was just like, Oh, I want to be a part of that ortho team versus I just want to like focus on taking really good care of people and, um, having that be my priority. And that gets to Jimmy's point of that attitude and how important that is. Great point. Noah's point is not as great. He says, got to bench more than your step score. <laughs> That is the old ortho bro culture that yeah, I had to throw it in there. Maybe is a thing at some programs. Angel, does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. That, that's very great. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks for asking that. I think yeah. we're running out of time, but, uh, I really just wanted to say one more quick thing. I think the best advice that I got angel was just to always try to, to anticipate the needs of, of the team and the patients. And I think that was the best advice I got was always trying to think a step ahead. Yeah, that is a really good point too. We need to, um, one of these days I'm going to take everything that was said here, condense it into a, uh, a sheet of paper, AKA notion document and put it, in, put it in the course. I'm going to, I'm going to do that because it does make a big difference, especially when you don't have a, a big bro looking over your shoulder and saying, Hey, try this or try that. So hopefully it'll be helpful to people. 
Uh, any final questions before we head out? Call tonight. Dr. Jimmy Gannon, Noah, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Amazing work. Appreciate everybody coming to ask questions and stuff. Makes it fun. Yeah, this thank was you. super fun. Uh, I look forward to doing more, more weekly things. Um, hopefully we'll get some more teaching going and uh, just have fun with it. So cool. Have a good night, everybody.